the problem of free will and moral responsibility. Uh, and to show how they differ, I want to consider the merits of each. And I think we will see that some threats to our freedom are both real and avoidable. And then I'll argue that certain features of our agency make the assumption that we're otherworldly very tempting, uh, or at least make tempting the nearby thought that we can't understand or explain our own agency in scientific and theoretical terms. For a long time, we in the West took ourselves to be, as Gilbert Ryle put it, ghosts in the machine. We took ourselves to be immaterial substances, spirits, souls, minds, somehow incarnate in and acting upon the material world. Those ghosts of the past still haunt us. It is, I submit, our underlying, intuitive, folk philosophical picture, even now. What it is to be free, we think, is to be able to rise above and direct the natural, corporeal, genetic, social, and biological givens of our existence. From some position, point of view, or conceptual framework that eludes their influence. We're free to the degree that we can step back and stand apart from nature and from nurture, and direct our lives as we ourselves see fit. To the extent that we're simply carried along by those external forces, it seems we're not free and not in control of ourselves. With the picture of the ghost and the machine operating in the background, it's easy to equate freedom with a simple lack of interference, sometimes called negative freedom. So long as you're left alone to make of your lives what you will, you're free. To the extent you're interfered with, hindered, constrained, or coerced, you're less free. If you're outright forced to do certain things, you're not free at all. So constraints and interferences can appear, so to speak, from in front or from behind. The options you face going forward might be constrained. Someone might have locked all the doors. You might need to choose between your money or your life. Alternatively, you might learn that certain forces determine your choices from behind, so to speak. Although all the doors are open, you are deceived or manipulated to ensure that you would choose the third door from the left. It can be natural to characterize this negative freedom that's by saying that when you are free from interference, what you do is up to you or in your power, in the devil's sense that it in some way originated with you, you were free from behind, and you had options going forward. At a minimum, you have the option of refraining from so acting. So some of the most traditional Western versions of the problem of free will arise from the possible interferences of God from behind and from in front, coming from his omnipotence and omniscience. A classic example appears in the story of Exodus. God explains to Moses that he will harden Pharaoh's heart against the Israelites so that God might display his power. That is to say, God acts directly upon Pharaoh's will, from behind, so to speak, changing it to his liking. It certainly seems that, in that case, Pharaoh lacked freedom. What he did, in fact, how he chose, was not up to him. It was up to God. But even if God were to refrain from exerting uh, influence directly on Pharaoh's will, God's omniscience seems to threaten freedom. If the future is already written there in God's book of life, uh, it seems our options going forward are constrained. It's as if only one door had been left open. So in contemporary thought experiments, neuroscientists do duty for the divine. They control people's thoughts in detailed ways by manipulating their brains. They act like God on Pharaoh. But there's no reason to deny the possibility of controlling other people's thoughts. Uh, we do it all the time, in fact. We persuade, we convince, we coerce, we deceive others regularly. It seems premature to rule out the possibility of such neuroscientists. Whether or not you or Pharaoh are subject to violence, and whether or not you're forced to do anything against your will, it seems plain that neither of you are either free or responsible. The trouble is not that you're not exercising control over these objects, actions, or people, at least in the limited sense of successfully bringing them to be as you would have them to be. The trouble is that your will itself is being controlled by someone else you're being caused uh, to make and execute certain decisions. Note how easily we slid between the last two sentences. Between the thought that your will is being controlled by another person, someone is imposing his or her will upon you, to the thought that you're being caused to make and execute certain decisions. Reflecting on the history of Western thought, we'll see, standing between God and the neuroscientists, the Enlightenment and Newton's physics. Physics seems to do duty 
for both divine omnipotence and divine omniscience by both acting upon our physical bodies and brains from behind and laying down one possible future for the physical world. In the picture of the world as it came to be painted in the wake of Enlightenment science, events and states of affairs at a given time are explained by prior events and states of affairs and the relation between past and future is governed by precise and mathematically describable causal laws or relations. But our actions involve movements that are part of the unfolding history of macrophysical objects. If the history of macrophysical objects is governed by deterministic causal laws linking past to future, it can seem that our movements are determined by appeal to prior events and states of affairs, which are in turn determined by earlier events and states of affairs, which are in turn determined by earlier ones, and so on, reaching back to the beginning of time. And so what we do is not up to us in both senses. We're caused from behind to do what we do, and there's only one possible future in front of us. Most people find that a deeply unsettling thought. The most natural response to the deeply unsettling thought is to conclude that events in the physical world must not be wholly governed by deterministic causal laws. Just as we must, if we are to be free, stay the hand of God and avoid the, neuro the meddling neuroscientists, so too we must somehow break the causal chain. The causal chain linking past to future must include some gaps, and happily, Newton's physics has been superseded at the quantum level, where causal laws are merely probabilistic. When confronting God or the neuroscientist, we confront another agent, one who threatens our negative freedom by interfering with or manipulating our decisions and choices. But determinism is not an interfering agent. If we assume that agency is itself worldly, then determinism is the claim that the processes that underlie our agency, the processes that generate and explain our choices and actions, unfold strictly from earlier states. That is to say, in the shift from God to science, we start to consider that the operation of agency itself. Notice uh, what we accomplish by denying determinism. We create some scope for possibility in what would otherwise be a fixed system. Even now, in medias re, the future might branch in several different directions. The fact that the future might even now branch in several different directions doesn't by itself show that which branch it takes is in any way up to you or in your power. Many things are possible, but not up to you. In a slogan, possibility isn't agency. It's because you're presuming that you have some ability to exploit the open possibilities for your own purposes. But how will you do that? presumably, somehow, by exercising your agency. That is, by deciding and by acting. But now we have to think about agency. To start with the observation that free action must be action. And events qualify as actions only if they're related in the right kind of way to the mind of their agent. In particular, an event that is your action must happen because you meant for something to happen. And what hap does happen must happen because you meant for something to happen. If we can't understand the event as something that occurred because you meant for something to occur, we can't think of it as an action at all. And if we can't find any other explanation for it, we'll think of it as an anomaly or a freak occurrence. Notice next that your meaning for something to happen is the sort of thing that must be able to be made intelligible by appeal to the characteristics of your mind. You must have had some desire, impulse, or urge, some conviction, purpose, plan, belief, or an intention. In order to understand an event as something occurred because you meant for something to occur, we have to see that it occurred because of some feature of your mind. And so free action must be a consequence of the operation of your mind, explained by its characteristics. Unlike other worldly souls or immaterial substances, worldly agents can't, so to speak, occupy the gap opened in the causal chain. We are rather knit in. What we do, our actions and our, the outcomes they cause, must be explained by the operation of our mind with its features. And those features are in turn explained by the prior features of the world, ultimately by features of the world we didn't choose. In contrast, suppose we did appear on the scene, ready-made, with psychologies formed elsewhere. Suppose we were otherworldly souls inserted into the world like angels stuck into bodies. If we were 
creatures like that, then the fact that the history of the world unfolds inevitably from its prior conditions would indeed eliminate our freedom. In fact, given what we've just noted about action, otherworldly minds can't act in a deterministic world at all. What happens in that world is not a consequence of the operation of their minds with the extra-worldly characteristics. And if worldly forces were somehow to act upon otherworldly psychologies to determine the choices we make, we would be forced to do something alien to us in much the way we would be if forced to make decisions by God or by the neuroscientists. Finally, in that scenario, we could restore our freedom. We could regain our ability to act by opening up gaps and breaks in the causal chain. We'd then be able to exert our otherworldly influence in those moments in which the outcome is, prior to our intervention, underdetermined. So the solution that seems most natural, namely deny determinism, would be a solution if the problem that determinism posed was the same sort of problem posed by God and the neuroscientists. And it would pose that kind of problem if we were otherworldly agents, free spirits from elsewhere. So it seems to me that certain forms of the intuitive problem of free will appear because we uh, haven't yet excised these ghosts from the past. We're still thinking of ourselves as otherworldly spirits. But if we fully embrace our embeddedness in the world, we don't face the same problem that otherworldly agents face. Even at first, even if our world is deterministic, uh, we can act. Unlike otherworldly agents, what happens in the world is, in part, the result of the operation of our worldly minds. Even if the future couldn't have been different given the past, our actions will make a difference to, what, uh, to the future. If we had acted differently, the future would be different. Our actions and our minds are part of the story of what happens in this world. So our problem isn't with action, it's with freedom. Our problem is no longer with interference or hindrance. Once we understand ourselves as worldly, we need to understand determinism as the claim that the processes that generate and explain our choices and action unfold strictly from earlier states. The processes that underlie and explain our choices and actions could hardly interfere with, hinder, or compromise our choices and actions. So one might instead think that the problem is with constraint. One might think that the phys physical determinism constrains us not because we cannot act or because we're being manipulated, but simply because we couldn't have done otherwise. Necessity seems a threat to freedom. Consider where, uh, in the story of worldly action, we could uh, insert contingency to help us regain freedom. Inserting contingency between your completed decision-making process and what happens next, so in front of the person there, simply puts some slippage between your will and the world. What you decided to bring about might not happen. Inserting contingency instead between your past and your character and personality simply makes your psychological development a little bit fluky. So perhaps we should insert contingency in the midst of the decision-making process itself. We would thus assure that it was not inevitable that you decide as you did. While necessity seems a kind of threat, contingency is no help. Our underlying problem, it seems, is that we lack an understanding of agency that makes clear either how determinism threatens it or how contingency or possibility would allow for it. And once we see ourselves as worldly, we shouldn't need to free ourselves from the world in order to be free from interference or constraint. Yet, when we consider the processes that underlie our agency, when we try to understand and explain it, it seems to disappear. One might now return to the thought that we appear on the scene ready-made and insist bravely that I'm simply being tangential, tendentious in calling such agents otherworldly. Agency, one might say, is an emergent phenomenon. It emerges from the physical world in a way that eludes reduction back to it. So, if we cast everything in the language of the physical, action will seem to have disappeared in the, in the world. And so the threat that we feel is not a threat that arises from determinism. It, rather, is arising from trying to understand human action in physical or mechanistic terms.